pick up and continue with this uh, subject of unity and making every effort to bring about and live in and flow with the Spirit of God in unity to take away one of these major tools the devil's got of divisiveness that so often even the church has played into uh, his hands. That's why the devil is all out to stop unity because he knows God will command blessings. So he's going to do everything he possibly can to divide us. So just carrying on with some of those helpful ingredients, uh, things that we can embrace and ask God to help us to walk through that will help us to not only come into unity, but walk together in unity. The next one is in chapter 5 of Ephesians, verses 3 to 9, and then in 11 to 15, if you push the pause button and read them for yourself. Avoid all sin. Make no excuses and make no compromises. Sexual sin, he talks about in verse 3. Anything impure, even what we read, watch, listen to, etc. Greed in verse 3. Speech, the way we speak, what we, comes out of our mouths. God calls all of this, if you look at chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 5, he calls this idolatry. It's like, if we keep on doing these things, sexual sins and that, they become idols. They take the place of God. It's not just some physical thing there, like a, a, a statue or even an expensive motor car or home. These things are idols. So any fruitless deeds of darkness, whatever the case may be, that includes so much wasting of our time on anything that opposes God's word. Think about that. I'd like to itemize it, but we just don't have the time. You stop and think about any fruitless deed of, uh, deeds of, uh, of darkness. Wasting time on things that are immaterial, have no significance of any sort, either in time or eternity. Uh, anything that opposes God's word. And all of these things, as I said, give Satan an opportunity to divide us and try to conquer. Moving on quickly, the next little point, five, chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Seize every opportunity that God provides. What does that mean? To do good, the right thing. Help, encourage. Whatever God opens up for us to do, do it. Your obedience can bring all of us as believers, especially those around you, closer to one another and open up more for God and for yourself. For others, every one of us. Moving on quickly, time again. He says in chapter 5, verse 4, but rather thanksgiving. Be grateful. Be appreciative. I know I cover this often, but there's so little appreciation, so little gratification, uh, uh, gratitude expressed towards God or towards one another. So keep praising God. Spend time praising Him. Stop and think of the things that He's enumerated. I want to preach soon on that. How much more shall your Heavenly Father give good gifts to you what all those good gifts are. I think I've right at this time it's coming, growing bigger. I've got about 35 or 36 th things that highlight that God has done for us. Uh, but just be grateful, but rather thanksgiving. Appreciate other people. Show them you're, you're appreciating. Respect. Thank them for the things they do as God gives you opportunity. You see, gratitude creates and releases dignity into people. So many people have been abused and misused, and God wants to release them from that. And when they release, that draws them closer. When we are still hurting and insecure, and we don't know where we can trust people, we're like a closed book, and we're away from people. But as that opens up, God brings us closer and closer together. It draws us closer and closer into unity. Moving on again, in chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, Let your light shine as light, not darkness. That's speaking about the way you live, you conduct yourself. The verse 8. People are watching us. In our church, they're watching us. In other churches, they're watching our church. In families, our friends, foes. Even foes are watching us. The unsaved. You know, even the demons are watching us. Division or unity? What's your life doing? The way you conduct yourself. What are they seeing? Obedience, 
or disobedience, division or unity. Moving on quickly to the 15th point, I think it is, find out what pleases God in everything. Chapter 5, verse 10 of Ephesians. And we already know that unity pleases God, how good and how pleasant it is, good and pleasant when brothers live together in unity. And all the things that please God are in his word and expressed through the life of Jesus. Spend time in the word, looking at the life of Jesus. Then he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17, live wisely, live wisely, not carelessly, not without guidance. Be careful how you live. Seeking God's will from God's word makes us wise. Let me read this to you. Not as unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I want to read this to you, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy again, chapter 3. Once again, just putting the emphasis back where it belongs so often in the Word of God, because there's so little scripture preaching today. But let me just read just these three verses. Paul writes and says this to Timothy. He says, And how from your infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise. Scripture makes you wise. The book of wisdom. I think I've alluded to this or touched on it before in previous messages in the series. But the book of wisdom is not just Proverbs. It's the whole Bible. And the scriptures make us wise. And then he goes on and he says, For salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then all scripture is God-breathed. That's why... Nothing can snuff out the word of God. The promises of God stand for eternity. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one word from of God's word will, will, will disappear. It's because it's God-breathed. It's inspired. You can't kill it. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And this wonderful reason why, so that the man of God, that's man, woman, young boy, whoever it is, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, the Word of God, live wisely. Make the most of every opportunity it gives you. Life is so short. And so it's so foolish to just ignore the opportunities that God gives us that will eventually drive us further and further apart if we just keep on ignoring. And that is divisive. There's a wonderful promise for all of us about wisdom. You know it in James 1, chapter 5. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And God gives generously, liberally, and does not hold back. He, not stintingly, he gives lavishly. So claim that for yourself. Moving on to the next one in chapter of Ephesians 5, verse 18, where he talks about the necessity of the Holy Spirit infilling. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's ongoingly. Be being filled. Without him... We will never have overflowing joy. So let's move on quickly so that I can finish this message in the allotted time here. The next one is found in verse 19 when he talks about encouraging one another, even with songs and music, singing to one another, encouraging, blessing from the heart. See, singing songs even to God that are not from the heart doesn't have impact and power but when it's from the heart it's then that that's true worship when it's towards God and when we sing to one another from the heart spiritual songs making music melody etc it's then that God is able to encourage people people are encouraged even when you people see you from the heart worshiping God you know that brings encouragement it, it the devil tries to use it when people look at you and you're not they can see you're not doing this from the heart. It's just half-hearted or just going through the motions. So sing encouragement when it's to others and sing encouragement even when you're praising God that it can be released into the lives of others. And then he talks in, the, in verse 19 and 20 of the chapter 5, be joyful, be a praiser. You know what that means. Then he comes to this important subject of family relationships. <clears throat> 
in chapter 5 verse 21 and 22 and 20 uh, chapter 5 from verse 21 to verse 33 he he speaks about mutual submission to one another first of all <coughs> excuse me submit to one another out of reverence for Christ you know i believe that if we're not submissive that's the true yardstick measuring stick of our submission to God the, how much a, a, a submission there is in our lives rebellious people people who will never submit always want to do it their way <coughs> excuse me they're really showing I'm not submissive to God so he says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and then he says husbands and wives you to submit to one another that's what he's saying here to one another and then he's that also goes further than that it's to one another in the body of Christ it's leaders to the to Christians that are not leaders Christians to one another Christians to the leaders etc there's a mutual submission that needs to take place to bring about and release and keep unity flowing and when we resist and become rebellious we just open the door for the devil to come back in and bring more division so husbands and wives and children are to submit to one another but in different ways the husband is to be the head of the home the wife is to be the heart of the home and the children on going into the future are the hope for the home i want to not just when i die that's the end of the daniels and their impact for god we want it to go on and on and on children are the hope for the home wives are the heart we will need united homes not divisive homes and we'll get united homes if we cooperate with the word of god you see domination when a husband tries to dominate a wife or a wife tries to dominate a husband a pastor tries to dominate people people try to dominate one another parents try to dominate children children try to dominate parents whatever the case may be it just releases such division and divorces and splits and it's just horrendous anyway we must move on this we're in ephesians chapter 5 verses 28 to 30 it says and take care of one another while this letter refers specific, specifically to family relationships, uh, uh, this part here in, in chapter 5, verses 28 to 30, it really is equally true for the spiritual family. Take care of one another. Just as you would take care of yourself, take care of each other, one another. And then he says in verses 32 and, and, 32 and 33, show respect. Let others know you respect them by the way you, your words, by your actions by your attitudes, the way you interact with them, the way you speak to them, the way you listen to them. Do you give them a chance to finish speaking? Do you always break in while they haven't even had a chance to express what they're trying to say? Show them, I respect your, that you see things differently. I respect your point of view. Give them that. These things bring us into unity to not do them just to keep on dominating taking over and not caring for one another it, it just brings division and gives the devil opportunity to stop the unity that commands blessing so show respect take care of one another moving to the next one it talks about in chapter 6 verses 1 through to 9 about authority and honor without which families are divided divorces rebellion split 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 oh, there's to be obedience from the children but wise expectations from the parents but you, Paul's really saying fathers don't exasperate your kids don't expect from them the unattainable unattainable expectations that have no reality in them respect those who serve you and respect those you serve respect them moving on the importance of the armor of God and I'm hoping I can get these last little few things in and bring this message to a close within the 20 minutes I normally aim at he says this in chapter 6 verses 10 through to 20 that we just stand against the devil's schemes the wiles of the devil if we don't stand against them commanded blessing will not come we need the full armor not just parts of it the full armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. I'm just going to quickly touch each of these 
briefly. It starts with a belt of truth around your waist. Truth. The, the belt of truth holds all the other armor together. Without it, the other the armor would just flap around and have no impact, open up gaps for sharp instruments to kill you, swords, arrows, whatever the flaming arrows, whatever they may be. But the belt of truth, so everything has to be rooted in truth. Truth is so important. Truth in the Word of God. Truth about Jesus. So it must be Bible truth, the belt of Bible truth. And truth about your own self and your situation, no cover-ups, the belt of truth. Then he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. And this symbolizes two things. Most people emphasize one of the two. Some symbol, uh, em emphasize that, that the, belt of, uh, that the uh, breastplate of righteousness is that Christ is our righteousness. So I can say I am the righteousness of God in Christ because Christ is my righteousness. So true. Other people emphasize the second part of what this, I believe, really means. And that is a righteous life in and through Christ. A righteous life. The breastplate of a righteous life. Because you can, people can't see the righteousness of Christ when you're living an unrighteous life. We need to have the breastplate of a righteous life and the righteousness of Christ impacting and imparting all the time into our lives. Righteous desires, righteous goals, righteous ambitions, righteous motives. All of these things promote unity. Or at least they lessen the possibility of, div of division. Then he moves on quickly to the shoes of the gospel. Witnessing for Christ, telling others about Jesus, being about what the Father's told us to do and discipling the nation, getting out there and getting the job done that Christ told us to go and do, that he started and wants to complete in and with and through us, keeps us from being divisive. It brings us closer together. When people are serving God wholeheartedly together, doing what God called us to do, instead of getting involved in all these little side wars, <clears throat> these things that just bring division, we just, we just open the door for the devil. But when we're doing it together, we don't get involved in all those petty little wars. And then he talks about the shield of faith. While we are exercising true biblical faith, it is close to impossible to be divisive or to be divided. When I'm believing God for all that God is and God says and his faithfulness, Everything in his word, the shield of faith, using it. Darts coming at me, I use the shield of faith. Believing God. It's almost impossible to become divisive. And then he talks about the helmet of salvation, so important. The mind, or a mind controlled by God, means we won't be led astray. And this takes place, a mind controlled by God, when we spend time with God. Studying his word, letting him impart to us revelation and impartation. Letting him transform us and make us more like Jesus. That happens when we're alone with God, with his word, more than anywhere else. It can happen in church meetings when we get in preach a preach or when we're listening to messages on the internet or whatever. The but we need to be alone with God. The helmet of salvation, thinking salvation thoughts. <clears throat> Embrace God's word. And then he talks about the sword of the spirit. Once again, the word of God. I don't know if you're seeing this. Unity is all about Jesus, the word, the Bible, and us doing, just cooperating with God. The word of God. And the spirit is able to, the sword of the spirit, he's able to cut through as we use the word of God. It deals a blow to Satan. And then he says, praying in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and request a praying christian will not be a divisive christian not a person saying things that look like prayers a praying from the heart a praying christian is a division healing warrior w-a-r 
A praying Christian is a division healing warrior. And then always remember who the real enemy is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, verse 12, but against principalities, powers, etc., etc. The real enemy isn't the person that's attacking you. It's the devil behind it trying to bring division, mess up your life and stop God from commanding blessing. So 20, verses 21 and chapter 6, verses 21 to 23, he says, encourage one another. Don't criticize. Criticism divides. Whatever you can do, do it to encourage others. Paul actually says, I, I'm going to encourage you by sending Tychicus to you and he will encourage you and you'll be encouraged. Um, why I've added this in is because no matter what it costs, it must have cost a lot to send Tychicus back to these Christians in Ephesus. But nothing is too costly to see God's commanded blessing, which can only come through unity. In conclusion, I would love to have had the time to read Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through to 22, which sums all of this up again. Read it for yourself. Philippians chapter one, uh, chapter 2, the first 22 verses. And may God bless you. And may he bring about unity. And may we see the commanded blessing in your life, through your life, in your family, through your family, in your church, through your church, and in our togetherness across the world and the whole body of Christ eventually when Jesus can come back and we can see what it could have been like for decades, centuries, had the church just come to, the, to terms with how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. There, God commands blessing, life forevermore. God bless you.